Hey, Chad. What's up? What's up? Thorchain GMI. <laughs> <laughs> the name is fitting these days. They had the space go last night. You guys did one with Kyber Swap, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a fun space. Uh, really excited about that integration. Um, it, like one thing that just stood out to me a lot with with having the the Kyber liquidity uh, aggregated is just like how often it's the best swap. Um, really impressive. So if people haven't seen those routes popping up yet, like check it out because it's often the best. So that's a really helpful integration. And then um, you know they're they're exploring cross chain swaps on their end as well, which uh, you know, obviously that's really exciting. Yeah, that was one thing I noticed using DoorSwap the past couple of days. The Kyber swap route is like really nice for, for ETH pairs, especially. It, it gives really good price for almost every route that goes through it and usually better than Uni. Yeah, exactly. That's That's what impressed me too. It's it seems like 80% of the time, I don't know the number, but a lot of the time it's it's the top one, which is great. Yeah, I don't know about you. I've just been like absolutely addicted to ThorChain stuff this this week. Like, I don't know. I can't take my eyes off of it. <laughs> I feel like every I know, week... It's too hard. <laughs> yeah, every week we get on here and we're just like, wow, like so much has happened in the last week, but... I don't know. This week especially, I feel like I've been glued to Twitter, Discord, just everything. It's it's just the most addicting thing I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've been working hard on the all the redacted stuff, so uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to when this finally happens uh, very, very soon. Always love a good redacted. It's uh, been fun to watch the savers just kind of like go up, up, <clears throat> you know? Just like check it every day, like look at the chain, like I think we surpassed 4 million or something like this now. So it's like pretty well fun to watch. Every day, check the chain. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, it, it felt like, it feels like just days ago we were watching it get to 1 million and then 2 million. And then 3 and 4 just happened with like <laughs> in what, 3 days or something? 4 days? Yeah, real fast. So now we're going to start kind of talking to the community and, and talking about, uh, you know, raising the caps and, um, and, you know, where we should do that or shouldn't do that and debate the pros, and debate the cons and figure out what we want to do as a community. Yeah, def- definitely want to dig into that quite a bit. I I uh, really want to understand all the kind of like the different risk profiles of the different synth caps and dig into POL. Um, I- I'm pretty fuzzy on POL, to be honest. So I, I still want to uh, ask some-, some some dumb questions when we get to that <laughs> just to try to really grasp it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So what's first on the list? What's what's the first item we want to talk about from the last week of Thorchain? Oh, man. Um, let's see. Cow said he's fixing his headphones. Um, okay, no, I think it's... Oh, sorry, like the, the noise canceling thing wasn't working, so I like, could not hear myself. So, all right, everything's good now. Yeah, yeah. So let's uh, let's talk about savers and, and POL, because I think that's kind of top of everyone's mind i think uh because saver is like three weeks old now and the last two days of savers just went absolutely bonkers once once the uh the calculation got fixed to to see like how much is left i feel like people started like oh god there's only it, it went from like you know 30 or 40 percent uh full to like 80 percent overnight and then it was just you know, just tapped it in into basically 100% Bitcoin uh, being full in in savers. So, like, it's just looking incredible over over three mil in, in the vaults right now. Real nice. So, we, I, we, let's talk a little bit about. I sorry, I don't know if you guys just said it, but um, you want to talk about what's going on with the the vote to increase the the caps and then how POL is going to start to work its way in there and how we're going to start scaling. Savers vaults. Yeah, so um, there's some a little bit of like kind of um, so, so there's a few things to consider, right? So right now we're at the, the synth caps at 15% of the pool depth, right? 
which is you know a good good starting place. Um, and so the the more synths that are that are in the pool, right, or, or the the higher quantity of synths versus like layer one assets in the pool, basically the the um, the riskier the protocol it gets in some sense, right? So for example, the situation that you don't want to see happen is that the synths value, the total like dollar value of all the synths together in a particular pool is greater than the total dollar value of the pool itself, of the, of the layer one assets plus the rune. Because then you get to a situation where like, it's the pool that is, you know, the, that is backing the value of the synths, right? That it, it is the collateral of the synths in some sense. So you can get to a, a, a kind of a bad situation there. And then in addition to that, like, and if that were to happen for some reason, then effectively LPs would get wiped out, right? Like their 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 position would be near zero, and the synth holders would would collect all their all their value in a sense, which is a, obviously a bad situation. So right now we're at a fifteen percent fifteen percent asset death relative to the um, sorry synth synth cap relative to the asset death, so that the pool death. Uh, and so in order for that to happen, that hypothetical scenario, that kind of extreme scenario, you'd have to see a 43x price change uh, in runes price to go down, for example. So it's, we're at like a dollar forty now or whatever it is. So divide that by 43. And that's the, that's the price that would become you know dangerous for the protocol. So I don't think anybody's really concerned about a 43x price change on rune because that's, that's pretty nutty uh, in, in many respects. But as you get closer and closer to like a higher and higher, that number changes. I think the intention of a lot of the devs is to put it to like a 50% relative to pool depth. And so that require, would require a 4x price change of rune going down versus uh, the assets to get to that hypothetical scenario. And the reason why 50% is the, is the number is, is for a specific reason. That is that um, if we were to enable the pol under 50 percent so we put it at like you know 25 percent or something like this uh, or let's say it's at, we say we enable right now right at 15 percent utilization for every dollar of savers that goes in into into the savings system the pol would have to put in six dollars worth of rune on the other side so you're creating a dollar of buy pressure of rune and then you're creating six dollars of sell pressure on rune which we don't like that, right? We don't want to create uh, that. That would mean that every time somebody is adding to savers or contributing to savers, they're creating uh, sell pressure on the rune asset, which is the opposite of what we want. Today, if somebody de deploys some, something to savers, it creates buy pressure on the rune asset, which is obviously a good thing. But the, when you want to get the POL involved, it could potentially have a negative effect on the rune price, which we don't want that for obvious reasons. That's why if you go to 50% utilization, then it's a one, for every $1 of savers that goes in, the POL would put in $1 of rune. And so it becomes an equal. So there's, there's a, net, a net zero effect on the, on the rune price. It's a dollar buy pressure and there's a dollar sell pressure. Everything's just level and even, and we don't have to worry about uh, any negative effects to the, to, the, to the rune asset in the long term. So that's, why the, that's where the 50% number comes from. It's just to ensure... We don't have any down, downward by, uh, sell pressure on the rune asset. Once we get to that 50% number, in order to get to a dangerous scenario, uh, you need to get to see a, f a 4x price change of rune or a 4x price change of the asset in either direction, it doesn't matter which, um, for you to get to that scenario, which is why the POL exists at all, right? That, that's their intended, the intended purpose of, of the POL is to ensure that that never really happens. That if even if the room price were to die by 4x, the PUL would jump, would, would jump in and provide value to protect the LPs from getting, you know, getting uh, uh, suffering losses. Yeah, let, let's go back and just talk about the, the liability real quick so people understand that. Because I think that, that's probably the most confusing part of Synths is just like, where, like, where is this IL, sorry, where does the Synth liability come in here? And how does that affect current LPs? Like, like how, how is that taking value away from LPs as, as, that, as that changes? It, so if there's price changes, uh, then that means that more 
more liquidity units need to be used to pay for those synths that are held by the savers and by, by the ARBs that are holding synths. So like r- right now it's 15% of the total pool depth, correct? So that's 30% of the asset depth. Right. So, so that means like 30% of the current Bitcoin, all the Bitcoin that's held in the pool is like 770 or something last time I checked. So 30% of that can be minted and that's currently about maxed out. So when we bring that up to 50% eventually of the, of the entire pool depth, that will be up to the maximum of the Bitcoin that's held in the pool. So it, it could uh, potentially, if there's 700 Bitcoins in the, in the, in the pools, we could mint up to 700 synth BTC, right? Right. That's the entire right. BTC depth. Right. 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 Okay. And then, and then as that price fluctuates, if the rune price goes down more than the Bitcoin price, especially, you know, very large amounts, then more of those units in the pools need to be going towards backing the synths. And that's how the synth, the, the, sorry, the value for the LPs can go down because more of that, more of the value in the pools need to go towards backing the value of the, the synth holders slash the savers. So that, that's right. my explanation of it, I think. No, that's a good way of, a good, a good way of doing it. And, and like what's actually happening in, in the back end for, for all that is that you have LPs are, have their own units, right, that, that represent their ownership of the pool, whatever quantity that is, which is generally very static, right? And then you have these um, synth units, which the network kind of holds on the behalf of the synth holders. And it, that number of units is dynamic. It's dynamically computed based upon um, you know, if Rune's price goes up, the number of units the synth holders have goes down. And if the if the Bitcoin asset goes up relative to to Rune, then the number of synth units. Right. It's basically increase. the liability. How much of that? How much of the asset is owed to the synth holders? And that that changes because the uh just the, the the price of it cha- in comparison to Rune changes, which is what the pool itself is holding, not the not the units them. It's holding the units themselves, but it's re- it's really holding. The, the rune and the asset. So that's why it, it changes dynamically with the price. Right, 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 right. Exactly, exactly. So, but I think part of the calculus, like at least for me, is it like by upping the synth cap and allowing more synths to, to, to come into the network, you are inherently making the pools deeper, right? You're, you're achieving the goal in a, in a quite literal sense you're achieving the goal of scaling the network and having it be more successful. And by doing so, uh, quite naturally, the, the, the room price would have some sort of correlation or relationship to it, not necessarily a one-to-one or whatever, but it, you know, if the network is being successful, then the room price should, reasonably so, uh, follow that in some sense or form. And so the odds that the room price is underperforming Bitcoin, for example, is relatively low in that scenario just because you know we're, we're, we're doing we're accomplishing the goal we're trying to accomplish which is scaling the network so that's like part of the idea is that like is that uh, it's statistically likely at least not guaranteed of course but statistically likely that rune will perform well as we achieve the goal of scaling the network could you just walk through like what would actually happen if there was a 4x price change um because, yeah, obviously, like, from this point, that seems really unlikely. But if you looked at from, like, a year ago or so pricing, then it starts to seem like that probably happened or so. Um, so, like, what's the flow? I mean, the, <clears throat> the, the POL would, like, sort of be the first cushion, right? So does that mean LPs would sustain higher than a 4X? Or, I don't know, can you just walk through that? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So the... You can think about the POL in some sense as being like a bodyguard or a bouncer for the LPs. And so as the risk to uh, LPs increases, the, uh, the POL takes on that, that risk and takes it away from the LPs, right? Like the actual only risk the LPs have really is relative to the synth cap, whatever quantity that is, right? which right now is at 50% of the pool depth. And I think a lot of people are pushing, or at least some of the devs are pushing for 50%. So you're, that, that risk is being, uh, you're taking a higher leverage room position as, this, as, as being a dual-sided L, LP person, whatever it is. But you don't go beyond that because be, if the synths synth go beyond that point, then the POL comes in 
and puts it back down to 50%. So it maintains protection at that, at that, at that amount. But imagine for a moment that there wasn't a POL. And imagine for a moment that there was like a 5x price change or a 6x price change, something like this, right? And we're, we've hit the scenario. For synth holders, they don't quite de-peg in a sense because the network will still redeem a one-to-one -one ratio between your synthetic Bitcoin and your layer one Bitcoin. It's just doing a swap, right? In a disaster scenario uh, like this, like all the synth holders, at least the, 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 the synth holders who want to leave, they can leave and get their money back. And eventually at some point, if you have enough people leave that like somebody's left holding the bag, you know, or whatever that is, right? Or the swap fees become expensive because the pool is getting more and more shallow. And so they're, the higher fees are being taken out, blah, blah, blah. And so like that can happen. So like it's not even at that cross that threshold, there's no immediate danger to synth holders in that particular moment. People can still leave. People can still get the, you know, one Bitcoin out for their one you know, synthetic Bitcoin, that, that, all, that all that math is still the same and still works just fine. Um, but we would probably wouldn't even get to that place just because the POL is there to, to, to provide capital to the network to increase the amount of value in the pools so that we maintain uh, uh, protection. Right, right. So we have the vote going on right now to determine what's happening with the synth cap. Uh, so that is going on right now. So if you're a node operator, I would recommend going in and checking out the vote and voting. Um, I, they, I, there's, there's some debate on whether to raise it to 30% of the pool depth as a, you know, as a middle stop before going to, to 50. But, you know, oh, the, the end goal eventually is 50% of the pool depth, which is, um, basically the asset depth in each of the pools and then we'll start getting pol turned on and uh i don't know if you if you have more thoughts about you know when we start turning on pol um so i guess that that should be probably pretty soon after the the, the synth cap is voted on so probably within the next week or two right yeah probably i think once we get once we get to uh at the 50 percent we definitely don't even need to get there. We just turn on POL and set it to set, to, set it to fifty percent. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that because you would actually set the, set the POL to forty percent with a ten percent buffer, so that it starts adding liquidity at fifty percent and it starts withdrawing liquidity at thirty percent, just so they don't we don't thrash the pools, constantly adding and taking away like all day long. It would just it wouldn't be very efficient capital or just create unnecessary transactions on the network. But um, we can do that at any point and then just raise the caps, you know. And I guess technically we would actually raise the synth cap to like not 50%, but like 55% just to create a little space between where the POL enters and, and where the Right, so there's, there's always a little buffer there where the POL is just, just adding in liquidity continuously and, and keeping the, uh, the utilization stable below yeah. the total cap. Right, because the synth cap would hit me like maybe let's, let's just say fifty five for example, it gets pushed to fifty five, and then the POL pushes it down to fifty, and then more savers enters, which gets pushed back to fifty five, and then the POL pushes it back down to fifty, and this becomes this kind of like, you know, back and forth. And as we're doing that, more and more savers are entering. The pools are getting deeper, 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 and we're providing more uh, capital and um, and cheaper fees for transactions and all this kind of stuff. It's like achieving what we're trying to achieve. Of, of uh, getting pool, uh, deeper pools. What if the what if the synth cap is hitting not because of new savers being added, but because of the rune price dropping? And then in that case, the reserve would be adding even more rune into the pool. And it's, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean new savers are coming in at that point, right? So is that a situation that's kind of, you know, kind of bad for rune if that's happening? Uh, yeah, that, that's a that's a totally thing that can and, and will likely happen. Like, you know, room will just have a bad day, whatever, and we hit the synth cap and then the, the POL adds more room and then maybe withdraws the next day when room recuperates or like it can happen in either direction, right? When your room's having a great day and then the synth utilization goes down and then more savers add without the POL even taking a larger position. It can happen in either direction. Um the negative about that scenario, say that happens, uh, and the room price 
goes down by let's just say 10 percent and then the pol adds more room to the to the pool which is adding room to the pool and causing sell pressure on the rune asset in that context so there is a little bit of reflexivity there for sure it's not death spiral style stuff it's not like anything anybody should be, be concerned about um but uh, it there is a, there would be a little bit of reflexivity there Brought up someone who requested to speak, Major Nelson. Hey. Hey, uh, don't worry. Just keep on going with, with your stuff. I, I just wait when everything is done. No worries. All right, all right. Sounds good. Well, is there anything more on, on POL? Like, it's uh, up in the air right now, just like when it's going to get turned on, but... It, we're, it, it's imminent, but it, it's going to be after the synth cap gets raised. And then what, once the synth cap that gets raised, that effectively doubles the amount of space in the savers uh, vault, like the, the total cap of the savers vault. So th there's going to be a good amount of time between uh, those most likely. So, yeah, one question on that is, so you don't want to have 50% synth without POL, right? Because that's, then you just have the four X and no no safe no uh, bodyguard, right? So, like these will probably come out roughly around the same time, maybe. Like, right. Yeah. So when when myself and uh, other devs were like working on the synth, like just the general concept of synth, like many moons ago, and we were analyzing the risk, the pros and the cons, the risks, all that kind of stuff, and we obviously re recognize that you don't want to have like a hundred percent synth utilization because that would be, you know quite dangerous to do and so we did some analysis of like what is a reasonably you know safe place to be i think the number we, that was we came up with was like i want to say it was like 30 percent or something like this or 33 percent or something like this i don't remember the exact number off the top of my head but it was like a year and a half ago i can't really remember and so we kind of like well you know like the closer you get to a full 100 percent utilization the, the more risk that takes on um and, and, and you can probably associate it to be in an exponential way and not, not linear. And so we was like, well, the point of sense is really just for ARBs to ARB. And so ARBs aren't going to need 100% of the pool depth to ARB the pool. Like that's just, that's completely silly. And so they're only actually going to really want to use like 10 or 20% or something like this. And so it, it'll just naturally, you know, and since don't have a, a purpose other than arbit arbitrage the pools. And so, we don't need to worry too much about this because they're only going to use a small percentage anyway. And there's no reason to hold a synth other than for our purposes, because there's no yield potential on it. We wouldn't take, the, take on protocol risk for Bitcoin. I just freaking hold some real Bitcoin. And so we weren't ter terribly concerned about it. But then as we started talking about savers and like yield bearing synthetics, then we had to kind of re hypothecate on this idea. And then that's where in like, we did what's why we, did, we didn't do savers in the beginnings because like we didn't want to take on you know higher synth utilization and just take on more risk and it wasn't until we came up with the idea of the pol that like oh this is the, this is the, the counterbalance to the risk this, this will take away the risk on an on-demand basis by by free market conditions and it can you know s scale quite well and efficiently and, and maintain um you know uh, or or you know not allow risk to to spiral out of, out of control as long as the pol can do what it does right and i talked about this in a tweet thread um when we launched savers three weeks ago where it was like i i laid out like all the risks like how synths can go wrong how savers can go wrong i had this long thread that explains in, in, in relatively good detail and so one of the things we have to be weary about or be, be concerned about is is situations where the pol is no longer adding no, no longer able to add liquidity, right? Uh, and because we put a cap on the quantity of runes we, that we allow the POL to do, or we hit the hard caps of the pools and the POL is not allowed to add more runes to the pool, or the price of rune is moving so fast downward, or the price of Bitcoin is moving so fast upward, uh, or they're, moving, they're both moving in both, both directions, you know, away from each other faster, then the POL can respond and the POL can actually add rune, right? I like guess adding rune slower than the, than the speed of which rune is moving in terms of price wise. And so there's a, a few changes that I actually would like to make to the POL myself uh, just to kind of be, to be more defensive in this regard, right? Like for example, um, to allow 
if the price is moving quickly to allow POL to add, add more rune faster. And the reason why we didn't do that initially is because we, the faster you add rune, the more slippage that the, that the, uh, the reserve takes on, which we don't like to have slippage. But if the price is really moving fast, then we, then we don't really care about the slippage, just, just support the, the LP, support the network, and that's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to change was, and this is going to sound counterintuitive, but like, is that allow the POL to add liquidity even beyond the economic, the hard cap of the pools, just because the most important thing is to, is to, is to protect the LPs and protect the network as a whole. And while that does open up uh, the financial opportunity for a civil attack, civil attacks take six to seven, eight months to actually do because you need to buy that lit rune and you have to get all your nodes churned in while your other nodes are getting churned out. And it's just like a very arduous and difficult process. And what's, what's more important is the immediate thing that's happening now in the market rather than something that might happen in six or seven months from then. And then if we get that problem, we can always just deal with it then. Likely LPs will just naturally leave anyways because they're making basically zero yield. And so it, it would likely just solve itself within the, in the next day or two, most likely, just because as an LP, you're earning zero, zero yield. So you're going to withdraw your savers or withdraw your LP position, which will just naturally um, put the um, economic security back into play uh, correctly. But the most important thing is to protect the network and the market conditions that it's in. So there's a few changes I want to make just to make it more uh, more defensive. Cool, that makes sense. Um, one other question I have here. Uh, so, so in the dev Discord, there's kind of like a nice summary of the the core team thoughts around the fifty percent and the nine realm thoughts around thirty uh, percent as a stepping stone to 50%. And uh, let me just read this because it'll bring up my question. So the core thoughts, we know 15% is safe. It's time to go up and capture more market share. Should be up, should be up, should be at 50% to stop price reflexivity. Ultimately could go up to 80% for maximum capital efficiency. Um, since the liquidity demand of synth exiters can be met with just 20% of liquidity. Uh, that part, <laughs> the 80% and the 20% is still kind of confusing to me. Um, could you clarify that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the viewpoint of one of the, the devs. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that, to be honest with you. Like, I'm not sure if I agree with that that mentality personally. Um, that's something that, that me and that dev should sit down and kind of hash out and, and talk in more detail. I think for right now, we shouldn't worry too much about we shouldn't really consider too much about going to 80% or whatever. We should just worry about, you know, the immediate goal of just trying to get to 50 or even 30. If you want to go to 30, that's fine with me as well. But I wouldn't want to go above 50 personally until I've uh, had more conversations with that person to understand their viewpoint. And maybe there's something that they understand that I've missed, which is totally possible. To totally, you know, that person's a very smart individual. Uh, but I, I'm not sure if I fully agree with that with that perspective. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, one other thing is, so the there's kind of this concept like the POL is uh, buying strong assets on the way up and selling weak assets on the way down, right? So does POL lose in any cases? I mean, um, you know, like what is the risk kind of like to the reserve? Can the reserve end up with way less rune in some situations obviously it's um you know there the, the ownership is there but is it can can it like take huge losses in some scenarios yeah that's a good question to ask so what the reserve is doing is it's taking its rune which it has approximately 170 million of it uh, it's not going to use 170 million we put a literally like a hard cap on it so at, at like a million to start you know and then we can operate over time if you want to but like it takes that rune and it deploys it in the pool and then it owns part of the pool, which includes the other, the other side, the asset side, not just the rune side, but also the asset side. And so the, the, the reserve is taking on the price risk of Bitcoin and the price risk of Ether and the price risk of X, Y, and Z, right? Most likely, um, uh, most of the price risk would, would be on Bitcoin because as we can see from savers right now, like, uh, I don't know the exact number on top of my head, but it, it looks like it to be like 60 or 70% of all the savers is in the Bitcoin pool. Bitcoin savers are very, relatively speaking, relatively like less on, you know, Litecoin. I think Bitcoin Cash is pretty high use utilization, which that was surprising to me to see. But uh, Bitcoin is by far the largest, I think, 
Yeah, all, all 24 savers on the Bitcoin cash pool are filling that up. But even even then, like Bitcoin cash, like the dollar value of the Bitcoin cash is relatively small because the, the pool is relatively small. And Bitcoin's the pool is like, like the biggest pool we have by a, a good margin. It's like nearly half of all liquidity is in the Bitcoin pool or something like this. So the price risk that the that the, the the reserve takes on is relative to its owning of the pools. And the more shallow that a pool is, the less price risk that it takes on. And the bigger the pool is, the more price risk that it takes on. Because if you have you know, 50% utilization in the Bitcoin pool, that's a lot of Bitcoin that the network's gonna, gonna you know, be a part of or own. And if you're taking 50% in the you know, Doge pool, which is very like shallow, that's not much not much exposure, not much risk, not a lot of doge that's actually holding, right? So your question of like, can the reserve like lose? Of course, right? Like if Bitcoin's price goes down or doge price goes down, yeah, it will lose in that scenario. It's a, the reserve is basically taking on almost like a an ETF position where it's just like holding the general position of crypto relative to the depth of the pools uh, and saver utilization. Um, but also in the, at the same time, it's also... Um, gaining a yield from from being an LP, like it's actually just like a regular LP, just like anybody else in the world, and it's it's generating its own yield from uh, the swap fees that are being like collected in the pool and stuff like that. It's a little bit more complicated than that because technically, what's happening is the reserve is what's paying out the block rewards, right? And so the block rewards are being basically paid out to himself. Like the reserve is the is the POL, right? So it's like taking block rewards and some percentage of that is being paid to itself, which being collected back into the reserve again. And so it's not quite at the same as like a regular LP because the yield for regular LP, um, I think it's like, I want to say it's 85% of the yield of an LP is from block rewards and 15% is from actual swaps and transactions. But the LP is, but the POL is actually an LP. It is, it is actually taking some percentage of the of the yield that the pool is being uh, is generating, and so it's it's taking on uh, uh, yield from that. So it has that obviously reduces the risk to the reserve. Over a longer period of time, I, I suspect that the reserve will be just, you know, making making money, um, and we actually already have the the like API endpoints to be able to track um, how the how the reserve is doing, how the POL is doing in terms of like, is it winning money? Is it, is it getting, gaining money? Is it losing money? Which directions are going? I'm sure there's going to be days where it's up and there's going to be days where it's down. My, my hypothesis is that it's going to be largely up it's just because as an LP, you are largely up as an LP, right? Over like a long period of time, maybe not in like three days, but if you look over like a hundred days or, or something longer, the, the longer you, position you take, the more likely you're going to be up. Right. And the whole point is to sustain these positions for for many, many years. So that way these positions can be maintained and they'll grow over the years. Right. Like it, it's not a short term POL thing. The protocol is going to be owning this liquidity and, you know, building these positions as savers grows, which will grow with the network. Yes. And there's a natural tendency that like as the asset is mooning, right, the protocol will acquire more of those assets. And as that asset is dumping in price, the protocol um, reduces its risk to that asset. So it's, a nat- it's like a natural like uh, trading algo sort of. And it's not really designed to be a trading algo, but like it's behaving like one in some sense, just by an artifact of, of trying to protect the LPs. Right. So if, um, let me just think this through out loud. So if, um, if the if the pol is putting rune in let's say to to doge <laughs> and then and then doge goes down uh mm-hmm. so so let's say utilization drops to 40 percent or whatever point where the pol would uh withdraw back right so then mm-hmm. so at that point the the pol is has put in some amount of rune and is ultimately withdrawing out less rune mm-hmm. so so reserve loses some rune but that rune has now kind of been like accelerated emissions in a sense right because um, it's just in it's in the pool like it's in circulation now uh yeah i mean you can think of it like um when the pol enters the a pool it is technically what's actually happening is it's taking reserve room from the reserve and adding it to a pool which is which is basically increasing circulating supply of the rune asset and the interest to uh, help scale the network, right? 
And then the, the inverse is happening when the reserve is withdrawing position. It's it's reducing circulating supply uh, of of rune. That's fair to say. Cool. Yeah, I think that, I think that all makes sense to me. Uh, is there any questions specifically about about POL? We can bring people up if people have questions about that or about the synth vote. Uh, if anyone wants to come up and, and comment on any of those things. Um, yeah, I guess it's just a straight vote to see whether we go right up to 50 or whether we make a pit stop at 30% uh, of the pool depth first. Bring it up, K coefficient here, requests to come up. With the pit stop, POL would still likely be uh, turned on at that point. It's just there's there's kind of like you're adding safety in one sense, but you're also then the, the POL is also um, putting cell pressure, right? So it's kind of like a trade off middle ground where it's like safer right. in some senses, well, but actually, also riskier in some senses. Actually, I, let me let me ask chat about this because this is the way I think about it. So if we start adding, say we go up to 30% of the pool depth, right? We make this pit stop uh, before going to 50 and we turn on POL and then we also increase the POL parameters afterwards when we change it to 50. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't it only be a temporary cell? Uh, well, actually, hmm. so, so the POL would be adding more rune in now than is necessary, than it is like, I guess, capital efficient, I get to scale the savers. It's adding in more dollar values worth of rune than saver space it creates. But when you increase the synth cap later, wouldn't that create all that lost extra saver space and be like a, a net net neutral at, at the end where it didn't create all that self-pressure or is that not correct? Yeah, I mean, my my advice or my, my, my personal standpoint, my two cents, is that we don't enable the POL until we get to 50%, at least 50% utilization um, on on the synth side. So we, we can make the pit stop at 30%, that's fine. And we can even enable the POL that it starts to kick in once it hits 50. We can do that today if we really wanted to. Um, but my, my advice is we do not turn on the POL because I don't want to see the price reflexivity, the negative price reflexivity on the rune asset that is that comes from the success of the savers. Like the, the point of savers is to make the pools deep and not to and help the rune price uh, you know, go up, but it doesn't really quite do that so much. If every time somebody adds to savers, they there's a bunch of the, there's a bunch of rune that's being sold in the market. Like that's kind of almost counter counterproductive in some sense. And so we can make a pit stop just to, just to make a pit stop. If people want to do that, that's fine with me. Um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't advise to enable the POL until we get to fifty percent uh, utilization. Did, uh, I answer, did I answer all your questions, like Soro? Because I, I know I know you had a bunch of questions. I want to make sure you, that I've answered your your your, your cues. Yeah, no, I I think so. I can't I can't think of any other specific ones at the moment. But um, yeah, I, I, honestly, I I just find this aspect personally like harder to grasp even than the lending design and things like that. Like just uh, kind of like the risks with like the leverage of leveraging LPs and. Um, I don't know. It's still h hard to get my head completely around, but um, you, right. you answered all my questions. Yeah, I think I think for me, like, synths in general play. The, you don't get synths for free. Like, there's always risk that comes with 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 with, with having having any feature in a network for the most part. Uh, sometimes you can have ones that are free, but like generally speaking, there's always risk to anything you're, you're pro any service you're providing. And I think for me. Uh, we always wanted to keep since relatively low because we were aware of that risk and there was no, there was no counterweight to that risk. There was no way to balance that risk out. And we thought about like using like, you know, synthetic rune as a counterbalance. We explored like tons of different ideas of how we can have a counterbalance to it. And none of them really felt very effective or very good at doing what they do. Uh, to, for me, the PL is quite effective. Um, and as long as it's able to, to do what it's doing, and it's not like disabled or turned off or there's some problem with, where it can't behave in the way that's designed to behave, um, and it and it can add liquidity as fast or as slow as it needs to in order to accomplish the goal that it's trying to accomplish, then I don't really have any qualms or concerns about kind of the, the synth disaster scenario that that you know could, like could happen in mathematical paper, because I think the PL will will do exactly what it needs to do to ensure that uh, everything stays safe. So I I don't have a 
I'm not really terribly concerned personally about getting to 50% as long as we, we put on uh, put on the POL. Yeah, that makes sense. I, where my confusion still is, is just like where, how, how the POL affects, affects the rune price really, because you have, you have new rune coming in and then this rune is, you know, buying, buying pool share and like, do ARBs react the same way? Um, because it's because it's new rune in the pool. So it's like you have X amount of Bitcoin in the pool and, and Y amount of rune. And now suddenly you have more rune. So it's like do the do. Right. But the, but the savers, the savers by itself counteracts that in the case where somebody's adding savers, you're adding a bunch of Bitcoin to the pool, but you're not adding rune. And so now the, the now you're creating, you know, buy pressure on the rune asset. And then conversely, when the POL adds rune, you don't have, you don't have, you know, you have too much rune and not enough Bitcoin. So people will create sell pressure on the rune asset. So those things balance out. But you were, what you were saying before is correct in saying that if the room price, you know, changes and then we add more rune, that's creating sell pressure and the room price changes and the room price goes up and then we're creating uh, uh, buy pressure on the asset. So it's just like, so like if room goes up or down, the POL will, will, will kind of in some ways uh, exaggerate or make it slightly more volatile, the room price, like it'll push it a little higher or push it a little bit lower. But the amount of that, like the actual dollar amount would be sub, in my opinion, would be like sub penny. Right. It would, it would be such a small amount that I'm, that, that I'm not really terribly concerned about. There is some level of reflexivity for sure. Mathematically, you can prove that on paper. But the amount of reflexivity, in my opinion, is, is, is relatively small that, that I'm not really terribly concerned about it personally. Right. OK, that makes sense. So, so where, we at, where we're at now, every, every dollar of savers basically creates 50 cents of, of room buy pressure, essentially. Right. Whereas my understanding with this is it's kind of... It, it kind of cancels each other out and and creates a net a net neutral situation for rune is is what I'm understanding except it still is deepening the pools and like there's still a lot of a, a lot of benefits of it but it's kind of like every new saver that comes in is is counteracted by the pol so it kind of creates like a net neutral on rune is is that right that's right that's that's only if you do it at fifty percent right right. Net- Right. If, if you if we were to say let's not do it at fifty percent, let's do it at seventy five percent or eighty percent. Well, now it's going to be um, a two to one difference where every um, every uh, dollar of savers that that goes in um, will create two dollars of, of buy pressure on the ruin asset. Like that's the benefit. If you want to argue, as that other dev might, that we w- we should push it up to to seventy five or eighty percent or some number. You effectively have a doubling. Uh, you have a, a buy pressure of like you know a, a, of two dollars for every sell pressure of one or something like this. Like it's it's net positive on the room price, and that that's the value of doing it, right? That's why we don't want to go at twenty five percent enter the enter the end of the field because then we're we're doing you know a bunch of sell pressure on the room asset. So fifty percent is neutral. Low of the fifty percent is net negative rune or like net sell pressure on rune. And then above fifty percent, it's net uh, buy pressure on rune. But then you have this the risk of since in like their, their value relative to LPs and the additional risk that LPs take on being you know um, uh, more leverage to the rune asset for you know the higher that synth cap is hit, right? And so that just all becomes part of the calculus and the thing that the community as a whole needs to discuss, debate, uh, argue about, and determine what we feel as a community is right. I'm happy to share my my two cents, but obviously I don't dictate what happens in this in, in this community or this project. So I just try to educate and inform people and tell people that, as straightforward as I can what the pros are, what the cons are, what the risks are, so that everybody makes an informed decision and then you know nodes vote to say this is what is uh, best for the network. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. Um, so yeah. I, I, I like the idea of what you said is even if we take the the thirty percent pit stop, maybe POL is already activated at fifty percent, and then in case weird price action makes it get to that point, then like that could be the POL kicking in for the first time, and it's still at the the fifty percent neutral spot uh, rather right. than the yeah right right that makes a lot of sense. Yep, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Yep. Cool. Let's bring up some some questions. Uh, kid coefficient. What's up? Hey, what's up, fellas? Uh, 
just a couple questions. Um, there was some talk of uh, like a rune uh, rune sabers feature and how that might play into the uh, POL and two are is is the reserve or the treasury already essentially in a POL position like didn't Thorchain seed some of the pools back in the day like Doge and probably uh, yeah the, the treasury like- does have LP positions the reserve is just the module that emits rewards so the, the treasury okay. does have positions but that's that's a like a discretionary fund that's not like a uh, it's separate from the reserve which is like a protocol protocol fund the treasury is discretionary but yes that that did uh like see doge and has lp positions and uh, a couple different pools you okay. can see those wallets on vblock yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I didn't know if it was from Treasury or Reserve or for calling that POL or not. Uh, I know it's kind yeah, that, of, it's kind of the opposite, but it, essentially, in the long run, it, it's the same position. Like those those POL LP units are earning yield and you know, et cetera. So, uh, right, right. You know, I was just wondering about that. The, the treasury did like contribute some value um, to the pools in the early days, just to kind of like get some depth to them, so they can, so you can have a reasonable trade and not be, you know, uh, you know, ganked on fees or whatever. Um, and I, I don't mean to be honest, I can't even remember off the top of my head like how much the treasury has in each pool, and it's, like, it's public information, so you can you can go to LP to a um, uh, Thor, Thor yield, whatever, and, and look it up and see what the actual positions are. Blah blah. blah. Yeah, I, ch- I checked this last week. It's somewhere around eight million in tr- in LP positions on, on Thor chain, spread out between uh, most of the major pools and some of the the smaller ones too. Okay, all right. Can you add some AVAX to that, please? Oh, just kidding. I, I'm petitioning for that. I mean, I think I think we do need the the treasury in on in on AVAX. Like we need those pools deeper for for AVAX. So I'm I'm all in on that. Please. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. What about the rune saving rune savers feature? Is that even possible? Or it, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know. So I I just. I just shared a tweet that I, I was just talking to somebody the other day about this concept. And I, so it is something that is being discussed and, and kind of researched. And uh, my view on it is that I, I, I'm not a big um, fan of it personally because it doesn't actually accomplish anything for the network itself. Like it, yes, it helps ruin people earn more room, which is, you know, like the community I'm sure would, would enjoy, but it doesn't actually accomplish um, the scale or expansion of the network itself. Like whenever you earn a yield, it should always come from like external things. Yeah. A hundred percent. I agree. Yeah. You can't, you, you can't just like stand in a circle and jerk each other off. Like it just doesn't really. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've always advocated like you need to LP your rune or run or, or bond it. That's it. Right. You know? Right. Right. But exactly. Then, you know, we have the savers feature. And now we're pulling rune from the reserve. And there's a lot of people out there that just hold on to rune because they're they're greedy idiots. But you know, whatever that's just my opinion. Yeah. You know, they're just speculating on it. I'm like, why don't why don't you why don't we use that rune as like you know, it's not POL, it's not reserve rune, but you know, it could be in place of reserve rune. Yeah, so if we were to do savers for rune, like straight up the same way savers is, um, it would it would just increase risk to the protocol uh, for sure. Like the, the the synth risk that we were talking about earlier actually increases doesn't it doesn't counterbalance the asset synths. It actually increases the general synth risk. Um, it doesn't seem that like that way when you first think about it, and then I I, I, I thought it would counteract counteract it, and then I did the math and explored it. Uh, mathematically speaking, and I just kept on finding over and over again that it would just increase risk and, and, and problems, potential problems for the networks, and I just wish to kind of just turn me off on the whole idea of it. Okay. But you 
but you could do it in a way where um, instead of doing savers and uh, rune savers in the traditional saver sense, instead the you give up your rune to the to the reserve, right? And it's the reserve starts deploying your rune instead of its own rune, right? And so it can right. assist assist the reserve in some sense, which is positive in one sense, but in the end, the, the P wall is going to deploy X number of room, right? Depending upon what the market requires, whatever. Yeah, because, the price and so, and so the total amount of room deployed to the pool would be the same, whether or not you deploy, you added your room to the reserve or you didn't. And so by adding your room or not adding your room, you're not actually increasing the depths of the pools because if you didn't do it, the reserve would do it. And if, if you did do it, the reserve wouldn't do it. And so just it's like a net nothing. Right. right. There's, no, there's, there's no actual improvement to the depth of the pool in that, co- that context. There's no actual improvement to the volume trades and there's no to the security of the network either. Yeah. Yep. That's what makes me feel like it's not maybe not worth it. But and not to mention that if we did launch this thing, the, like the quantity of room that we would deploy into the POL would be far less than the quantity of room that people would put up to to be deployed, which means that the yield would, would be, you know, likely likely the yield would be incredibly small for rune holders. They would, they would get like, you know, yeah. sub, sub half percent probably or something like this because it would be such a high demand for it because everybody wants to earn rune the rune because this, this community loves rune for some reason, right? Obviously, we're all big rune fans. And so if yeah. you don't earn your rune, it's just like in a very easy and straightforward way. It's obviously very popular. That's why you see, you know, on, you know, Adam, for example, it's like 90 something percent of people are, are, are delegated and, and proof is, and are, 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 you know, put up their, their Adam to some staker. You have high percentage of participation. And if the participation is that high, but the yield is that low, it would, it would just be, you know, it wouldn't be worth it. I don't know. That's just my, my two cents. Oh, I agree. I was just, I, you know, uh, people, if people would, could see that like you're not if you if you just staked your rune in this scenario you're not going to earn much money because you're not really contributing anything to the network so you don't just you wouldn't necessarily like quote unquote deserve a high yield on it because it doesn't really right. do anything the, so. you're you're actually what you're doing is you're assisting the reserves so, so the reserve is taking on uh, deploying less, less rune itself and for doing so um, you know, it, the reserve would take 50% of your yield and you would take 50% of your yield. And so that's, that's like the trade off. It's like, but why wouldn't the reserve just take on, you know, just use its own room, which it happily has large quantities yeah. of, and right. just get a hundred percent of the yield. Right. And, and, you know, why wouldn't it just, just do that instead? Like, you know, so it becomes that kind of interesting thought and, and debate to have. Yep. yep. Yeah. I still think, yeah. If you don't want to LP, then, you know, put your other asset into savers and then, and then bond your rune in a pool. Done. Yep. Yeah. You can, you can, you can do it however you want, but that's, that's one way to go with it. All right. Over. Thanks. Thanks, Kay. Uh, Kenton. Hey. No. Hey, guys. Awesome. Thanks for doing this. They're always great. Um, so with, with just the scenario here, we get the synth, synth cap to 50%, protocol, the POL kicks in, and let's pretend it owns like 10% of the pool. What happens when a new LP comes in, like a human comes in and deposits money? Does that slowly wind down the, the POL to, to get to zero? So uh, there's a target... Uh, synth depth and if someone this is my understanding of this if someone deposits and that makes the, the synth depth decrease because you've increased the asset depth but since it remained unchanged that means the the pol would start to remove some of its position to maintain it wherever the, the target depth is so if uh the, if the depth is currently at 50 percent the, the synthetic asset uh Usage is at 50%, which, which would be the max here. And then POL will add when it's over 50% and take out when it's below 50%. Is that about right? Yes, I think, yes, I think your answer to my question is yes. So as, so as new human come in with new LP capital, it's basically just buying it off the reserve. 
until the yes. reserve no it's longer. Swapping, right, it's swapping positions with the reserve in some sense, depending upon what the synth utilization is. Like the synth utilization is at forty five percent or something like this, then you know there's no relationship there. There's no swapping up positions. But if the res if the reserve is you know at fifty percent and somebody's entering or leaving or whatever. Uh, the the POL is just swapping positions. It's like it's almost like you can think about the POL as like the LP of last resort. It's yeah. To ensure like the, the capital enough capital is in the pools to back the synths. It's, it's always it's always going to ensure that, right? To make sure that 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 the synths are good and a good place, and the LPs are taking, are not getting fucked with, with overexposure. It's always there to to support the LPs and support the it savers. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Yep, yep, no problem. Uh, Juggernaut was up here. Okay, he's gone. Um, Ellis, hey. Hey, uh, I had a quick question about the the um, the synth cap. So we're at, I think, 15% right now. And my question was, if we go to, uh, is each percentage increase a, li a linear increase? Or is that uh, is there some mul a multiplier on that? So if we go to 30%, do we get double the amount of current... Um, uh, liquidity we can ha handle in savers, or does it go up some more than that? Thanks. Uh, no, it basically doubles. Basically doubles. So like all of a sudden, we can, right now we got you know four million or so, whatever the hell the number is in savers, and so we can we can go to you know probably eight or or higher. So the the it seems to me that yeah the best case scenario would be like we go to thirty percent, and then the price of room just just keeps going up, and we never have to enable the POL. That would be like the Best case scenario, right? In some in some sense. I mean, that's a possible case scenario because as we go up and we add more, you know, savers in there, that means the pools are getting deeper, which is a good thing. But it also means that the yield is coming down because the incentive pendulum is swinging towards the nodes and away from the LPs. And so um, there there is that kind of hypothetical scenario where we never even get to fifty percent because um, once we get even we're close to fifty percent, the the yield is low enough that new new capital isn't coming in anymore, right? In a sense. Yeah. So then, if the price uh, of rune increases, then it would increase not only the size of the pool, but also um, potentially the yields as well. Um, but if you're saying we go to thirty percent, then in theory, it would it could cut the yields in half. Is that correct as well? No, I wouldn't cut the yield. <coughs> excuse me. We wouldn't cut the yields in half. Um, I don't know what the exact number is, top of my head, but it, it would be it wouldn't be that wouldn't be anywhere close to half. In fact, it would probably be, I don't want to say a number because I, I feel like I'd be very wrong in saying it without doing the actual math, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be that much for, for anywhere, anywhere close to that. Yeah. And that, and that's because uh, you're only adding depth to the, sorry. So in, in this scenario, it doesn't actually decrease the yield by half because it just decreases the amount that each LP would be getting from this scenario because each LP's share is slightly decreasing, but you're not actually increasing the the overall liquidity that much. We're just doubling this like $3 million of liquidity. So that's not actually decreasing the overall yield, but it's decreasing the yield to each LP. I see yeah, it's complicated because at the same time, adding another $3 million in savers is is half of their yield is going to go to the LPs, right? The question is like, are is the deeper pool is going to create more volume? The tendency is yes in that in that question because the fees become cheaper and cheaper fees just garners more uh, trade volume typically. Um, yeah, it's very complicated. There's a lot of moving pieces and gears to it, but but... The, the yield would come down for LP, uh, the EPs, but I don't know the exact number. It's kind of hard to calculate. Yeah, that's almost why I'd like to see it go to 30%, just so we could like have a, we could see what happens when it goes to that point and have like a, a way of measuring, way of, do some analysis on it. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a fair position to take, right? So we can do that as a community, or we can just say, we'll just go to 50. I, thought, I don't care. Either way, it's fine with me. Yeah, it's probably good to take some time, especially over over the holidays too, rather than just like turning on POL like you know two weeks before, <laughs> like before the holidays and, and stuff like that, where you know, people are probably gonna want to like you know, take time away and stuff like that. Um, like as as an interim, it might be better to just do that and then go up to fifty percent in 
in January once uh, the, the new caps start getting hit again and, uh, you know, just, just give it more time to, to develop. So, you know, th- there's two arguments there. I, I think, I mean, eventually it'll, it'll end up at 50. It's just, you know, the, the, the path that we take to get there. Cool. Thanks guys. I also, I do kind of like that idea of like a, a rune staking where you could have like an insurance pool or something. That's an interesting idea. Uh, even if it was a very small fraction, the fact that there is no current way to do to get any yield on rune alone, um, uh, even if it was only like a quarter of a percent would still be, still be better than nothing. Well, there's a way, a way to do it and that's running a node, but I recognize that that's not, you know, available for, for most uh, rune holders. Yep. Thanks for uh, taking my questions. Appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, Major Nelson, do you want to ask a question now? You, you can ask about anything. Okay, sure, cool. Um, uh, we had, uh, there was like a, a a question on Twitter like this week, I don't know if it, if it was Thor Maximalist or something like that, from a, from a note perspective on who should be favored like now going forward, like landing or increasing the number of chains that added. And then there was the the argument coming up that right now with the current room price, it's not really viable for node operator to add a new chain because like it costs more to add a new chain than the chain actually brings, which brings me to the point that now that the year's coming to an end and there was a lot always a lot of discussion with like so called like low value adding chains still being on, like I know I remember it was like talks about B cash and maybe also like Doge, who was like very low in actual participation, and I'm currently also like um, saving in the BNB vault, which is like one of the smallest vaults with the lowest amount of BNB in it, but it still has like the lowest APY, which just shows me that like there's literally zero to none activity on the BNB on BNB on the BEP2 chain itself. So why why don't we just like have like a, a a big discussion or a big like vote especially from the from the node operators on which chain we actually want to keep and maybe if we get if if the node operator come to the conclusion that they okay let's get rid of like this this and this chain because all of a sudden like those add those don't add up like more than 3% of all the volume but instead of those three chains maybe like add one new chain which is like get rid of three add one new maybe like bsc or or matic or something like that like high volume chains now so uh, i was just wondering what's your opinion beyond that like having a like a year-end discussion about which chain should remain in or maybe get kicked out for making space for for new chains thank you yeah, I think if uh, anyone is node operator and wants to get rid of chains, you can you could start that anyone could start that conversation just in the dev Discord where people normally discuss, especially just make relay if, if you're a node and you want to start campaigning against having certain chains on on Thorchain. And like, I mean, the argument that you bring up is totally valid. Uh, I mean, there's been two major new chain additions since the summer, and that's Atom and Avax, and the, the the cost of running the infrastructure so that's uh, you know about 100 nodes on thorchain each running uh the the the, the chain daemon for avax and adam it, it's very expensive and i don't i don't know if adam covers the cost but i know avax for sure does not uh the the, the fees that are brought into the nodes do not cover the cost of running the actual running the actual chain and I think it's definitely too early to like go up with bringing those, but like if you're talking about other chains like Bitcoin Cash, um, unless you're thinking about it from like a security perspective, which is which is totally valid of like you know wanting to get rid of like unnecessary um, surface area, when in which case I think that's totally valid. Um, like Bitcoin Cash, like how much does it cost to run a Bitcoin Cash node a month? Probably like like fifty bucks, uh, the hundred hundred bucks at the most to run a Bitcoin Cash node per per month. So like. While there might not be so much activity there, maybe it doesn't all. Maybe it also doesn't make sense to remove it. And maybe I think that's just part of the equation. Um, and part of the reason why I'd like to see like something like Dash on on Thorchain, just another low low cost node to run, uh, which would add you know volume and 
through through Thor chain because it's like the Avex pool is, is not getting the use that it um that that it could be it, it but the liquidity is low so it's like you know I, I think both these like just need some time to develop and then I, I think I think eventually we could see chains being removed and, and added I think Binance Smart Chain is likely to come to Thor chain especially with aggregation and then I think after BSC gets added, like, this is just kind of like, this isn't for sure what's going to happen. This is just like my opinion of what, what I think is going to happen. I think that the next thing would happen is uh, Binance Smart Chain integration in, you know, some, some time within the first half of, of next year. And then uh, based on the results of that and then DEX aggregation being added onto that, that's kind of where we see the, the, the future of... Uh, where where chains go on Thor chain? Like, are we going to start adding more? Are we going to start getting rid of some? Because if the Binance Smart Chain integration is a total flop, and you know people don't push volume through that, uh, then I, I see it as pretty grim for the if adding more chains on top of that into Thor chain. But on the other hand, if that goes really well, then maybe it's it's still on on the table. So there's definitely a discussion to be had about this, for sure. Yeah, I think it makes what do you, sense. What do you think? Chad? But- my opinion is that because we're in the bear market and in general, liquidity is kind of hard to come by just because, you know, it's bear. Uh, and adding new chains at this point will probably not garner like large adoption or volume or liquidity, even if it's a chain that's high volume, like, like AVAX is like, a, you know, it's worth a lot. The market cap of AVAX is relatively high. Uh, and so instead, I think it's during a bear market, it's probably more effective or more efficient to be focused on the core fundamentals of the, the, the core chain and, and try to deliver things like lending and savers and these kind of things like that are probably more profitable for the network or, or more beneficial to the network to work on these things than just to focus on um, chain iterations. Like I would still like to see chains be added in general, like especially things like Monero and maybe Binance Smart Chain and maybe Dash and these other things. Like, but like especially chains that are that are not that the community behind that chain is like Dash community are asking for integration i guess so they're, they're showing that they're interested in that, that that the liquidity will be there because we have people yelling from the dash community about hey, getting dash added but if we don't have anybody from the binance smart chain community saying hey where's binance smart chain like it just doesn't exist and so that makes you feel like this even though it's a high, more high market cap asset with a bunch of like dex aggregation and whatever nobody's asking for it and so it wouldn't probably wouldn't get utilized all that much you know and so but i think that lending uh, in order books and savers and like these things would get utilized because it offers something that nobody else is, is can, can can offer, and I think that would just be more beneficial. Yeah, yeah. I'll just add, Go, going. Oh, sorry, I'll just add one one quick thought, which is like it's entirely too soon to call any of them like a flop, you know, like AVAX or even if BSC was added. And I understand the the you know, the, the node operator perspective, because with the rune price low, you know, they're like not that far away from not making a whole lot of money on their costs. Right. But if, you know, if, if rune was even, I don't know, $3 or something that would probably change this equation a lot. Right. And it might make sense even at that level to add another chain or two. But, you know, I think with, with, with all the integrations, throw you. Oh yeah. He's speaking. You probably just can't hear him. So, Oh shoot. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll let you know when he's done speaking. All right, you I, can keep speaking. Okay, yeah, just real quick. Um, just with all, all the all the integrations coming to as well, like you know, uh, Thorchain and aggregation showing up on on external places, right? Like not just on our own ecosystem projects. Um, you know, I think naturally over time, there's just going to be new entry points into Thorchain that we're 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 not seeing right now, right? Like w- like when when this is powering so yeah. many wallets and, and, and integrated into existing DEXs and aggregation, like that, that volume is going to come. Um, and yeah, it is the bear, but like, you know, something like AVAX or BSC someday are going to be doing tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of volume, I would imagine. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. Like there might be some like room for tweaking. Like it, it, I think it is arguable whether to like, I, I think there's an argument that could be made for like replacing Adam with like like osmosis for aggregation or, or something like that. But I think there's no like major changes that that like need to be made right now. Just like from from my own opinion, uh, but I I do think that what like the the argument against uh sorry the argument for BSC 
is that it actually does, you could argue whether it's real volume or not, but there is, if you look at Rango Exchange, the volume, like if you do analysis there, you see that Binance Smart Chain is like always right there with, with ETH in volume. And like we, we have great we have great volume. Some of our biggest volume chains are the Binance Beacon chain ones, which are literally zero volume anywhere else. So like, I, I think there's a, a pretty clear case, especially with like the, the places where ThorChain is going to be in the next, in the next couple of months, it, it makes sense to, you know, get like a, a, like a pancake swap aggregator on top of BSC and then start p- pushing a bunch of volume through that. Like, I think that would be a, wildly successful. But then again, I also said that AVAX would be wildly successful beforehand. And although we haven't seen that yet, it, it, it'll, it'll go in that direction. But the, the point is that AVAX doesn't have that, that same volume trend on, uh, on other aggregators like, uh, like Rango Exchange or just any of these other multi-chain DEXs. B- BSC is always on top of those when you compare to, you know, something like Avalanche. Polygon's up there too. And ETH layer twos are like super interesting. But yeah, just, just the cost is the uh, the hard selling point right now. What is it like? Is it like 1500 per node operator? What? How much would a chain like that add? Do we kind of have an estimate of that? If Pluto was here, I'd ask him. So I, I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, like I, I think like one of the, one of the, uh, point is also like I guess a lot of volume on the on the BEP2 chain is coming from like BUSD since it's just the cheapest and fastest like stable coin to trade on and I think that would also be like on BSC as well so maybe like if BSC is added then one could have the argument the argument or the discussion about okay maybe retiring the, the BEP2 chain after BSC is is launched maybe maybe that, that could free up some space and also like from the argument that chat made before like maybe maybe there is not a lot of volume going through bsc uh, we only know that when it's when it's up and running that's true because like w- which is also like unique to the bsc chain and the bnb chain itself it's like that probably i don't know i mean correct me if i'm wrong but i guess like 99.99999 percent of all bsc users have a Binance account. So, I mean, I don't know how, how large their their hunger for like cross-chain swap is when you can take your BSC, BUSD and just transfer it to, to Binance and buy your BTC over there. Like, I don't know how, how attractive that will be. Like, that's also some, some point to, to chat point before. But um, yeah, that's, that's from my side. Thanks very much for taking my question. Yeah. And by the way, uh, Node operators, I feel like there's been a push you know, in the last like month or two about node operators getting off of like cloud providers and building their own physical bare metal because it's in, in the bear market, they're, they're, they're producing less yield, right? And their cost has been the same. Their operational cost is the same at what, like three or $4,000 per month of operation, which is, you know, what is that? Uh, 40 or $50,000 uh, a year of, of operational costs. But if you have a bare metal box where you spend maybe five thousand or ten thousand dollars for that box, like you just buy it once and there's no monthly fee to it, so you just like it's so much cheaper to run on bare metal. So because of that, I've just I think I've seen like a few uh, quite a few node operators are starting to move away from cloud and moving towards bare metal just because it's much more efficient and cost effective for them to do so. Yeah, that's a great point. And another thing is just. I think the most ideal scenario is all, all these new uh, integrations bring so much volume, uh, you know, savers keeps taking off, rune starts burning with lending. Uh, like th- this equation could be really different, like in <laughs> really soon, potentially. Right. And, uh, you know, like nobody was talking about how much it costs to, to add a chain when, when rune was, was $15 and, and node operators were just absolutely raking it in. Right. So um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just hopeful that it doesn't get like too shelved. Um, but at the same time, I understand uh, just like that node operators aren't going to node operators can't be losing money because then they're going to start leaving and we have to keep those incentives up. But at the same time, like there's so much uh, expansion room to like really fulfill this vision still. And like that, that's going to, in my eyes, that's going to require like, yeah, BSC and aggregation, osmosis and aggregation, like but even AVAX is going to end up being super important at some point, I think uh, even, even maybe Solana at some point. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And 
it, it's just time to push it to the back of the shelf right now. I mean, it, it has been. That, that's been like the general consensus. I think totally with Chad. It's like, not we, we don't need to do this right now. But I, I think in the, the first half of next year, like th- th- there will become an opening to to do this, and then you know we we, we take those openings whenever they're whenever they're available. So. Hopefully, hopefully we get there because it's like if you if you think about this from like the logical like evolution of, of Thorchain, um, and let's just say like you know like hypothetically for example, there's many people doing doing swaps in like like Trust Wallet for example. Uh, how many of them do you think have BNB on the Beth two chain versus BSC? And what do you think the demand is between swapping BSC? on something like trust wallet versus uh you know binance beacon chain bep2 assets i'm sure there is huge demand for the bep2 assets i know there is huge demand for the bep2 assets and people want to swap those there's literally nowhere you can swap those right now so we're the the sole provider of those but being the provider of both that's a huge volume driver to thorchain and like uh you know i i think the natural route is to go there and then start activating pancake swap and all the other dexes that are there. If there even are any other dexes, I have no idea. They're probably named after food. But <laughs> hey, uh, Ponzi Ninja. Uh, I don't want to open up a can of worms here, but um, yeah, want to just share a personal experience I recently made. So. Um, I was actually using a bit of Monero, bought that on KuCoin, and then wanted, after a time, wanted to send it to Binance and just cash out in uh, BUSD. And what they did was they locked my account. They froze all my assets on the account, not just the Monero, like all my assets were frozen. And I had to go through this, like annoying process where I had to explain to them where I bought the Monero with which money I bought the Monero and stuff like that. So I think it would be a really, really good use case uh, for ThorChain to add uh, Haven and Monero. So that's the only permissionless uh, DEX in the world right now should, in my opinion, have a privacy option. That's just my opinion, though. I mean, yeah, that's that's like uh, the perfect manifestation of why we need DeFi and why centralized parties and KYC and all this kind of stuff is just complete horseshit. And that's, that's partially why I love the idea of adding Monero personally, just because um, having a privacy chain and a way of getting in and out of something like Bitcoin and maintaining your personal privacy to do so, if that's something that you that you desire or want to have for yourself is like, it's beyond the economic value that that may co- contribute to the Thorchain network. I'm speaking from more an idealistic perspective. And it, it just like, it, that is a new form of privacy and human rights that I would just love to see it happen. Right. Like, just, oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So Chad, on that subject, is someone currently working on Monero uh, on Thorchain? I don't know if that's actively being developed right now or researched. The, it is actually actively being developed. So what happened was, the Monero team were working on the Monero like chain client, and one of our devs, not me, but one of the one of the devs um, was looking at it and was let's we'll just say that they were dissatisfied with the the quality of the implementation. And so, I think um, a couple of the devs and the team just decided to like basically start over more or less and build a, a different kind of structure to it. And so right now it's actually being built as a um, um, that they fork the code of Thorchain and they're adding Monero to, to this like fork um, and kind of seeing how it works out just to just to try it out, like, like be able to make a bunch of code changes without needing to worry about, you know, um, like the rest of the chain or, or anything else. Just being able to kind of go off their own, uh, their own little side tangent and, and just kind of play around and work with this idea and just like try it out. Once that's completed, um, whether that gets merged back into the core, like, you know, pipeline of Thorchain or an actual fork is launched with Monero and Bitcoin, Ethereum, and probably Thorchain itself as well, that remains to be seen or debated or, or discussed, or whatever. But there's still strong desire to, to add Monero to the, um, 
to the uh, torching um, ecosystem. Is Monero on the cheaper side uh, for for notes? Yeah, anything basically anything that's a UTXO should be pretty cheap, right? Anything that's a UTXO chain will be, will be fairly cheap. Um, that's basically how that works. Solana is probably like the most expensive. It's it's, it's super super massive uh, requirements. It's like you probably spend three to four thousand dollars just on the, on the on the Solana one if you want to add Solana. Yeah, Monero has what like thirty second block times, and the like, there's no smart contracts or anything like that. It's it's pretty light chain, which is also why I was I was saying I'm in favor of of Dash, just because like these, these light chains have very little overhead. Like they they have a lot in in way of like code complexity and, and like opening up like every chain is like its own like attack vector basically. So like there is like concern from from that direction, especially Monero, right? But um, from from like the actual cost standpoint, like that's totally not an issue from those. And by the way, like Monero is actually really complicated to integrate with. Like it's it's a great chain. It's well it's well designed in many respects, rig signatures, all that stuff. But that just makes it extremely difficult to handle. Like even even small things, like for example, when you do a, a Monero transaction, you can't actually spend your your that UTXO that you received. Um, for like, I think it's like 20 minutes or something like this. And so like how you do UTXO management is different. And so like what happens if somebody does a large deposit of Monero into the network and that we've just like five times the, the, the depth of the pool and then somebody comes by and does like, you know, a massive trade, but the network doesn't even have that much Monero to be sent because of this, you know, delay on, on access to the UTXOs of the blah, blah, blah. Like it's, there's so many edge cases that are just like, that, that's kind of a one example, but there's so many like weird and complicated edge cases, like how do we get around this, which is why there was this, this di- desire to just fork it, run off to, to, the, to the, the side and just like hash out these weird oddities and how we're going to get around X, Y, and Z and, and still, you know, functionally work right, right and maintain security and, and be able to, to have the same feature set and as the regular you know, regular uh, chain. It's really difficult and complex to do for sure. Cool, cool. Anyone else want to come up for questions? Was that the uh, Haven client you were talking about? Because uh, Haven had a client ready as well, right? Uh, no, well, so they put together a client for Haven and, and one of our devs reviewed it and just was not satisfied with the code quality. And so, um, that's what triggered that dev to go off and just build their own client for uh, a crypto note chain like Haven or like uh, Monero. But I think the intention is to, to, to go directly to Monero, uh, Monero and, and, and not, not to Haven. But at least in that, at least in that first, not that I'm saying like, we'll never add Haven or anything like that, but just... Um, obviously, Monero is the more more valuable asset between the two of them. Yeah, one hundred percent. And last thing uh, uh, I will uh, say about this is also, I think we first of all, you mentioned it before, Chad. Like from a ideological perspective, it would be amazing if uh, Monero would be integrated. But I also also think from a value perspective, um, we are underestimating like i think monero within the next couple of years probably gets delisted on every major centralized exchange and it would be a huge value add like i think it, it would have like a huge reflexivity effect even if thor chain succeeds uh, succeeds in a sense first that uh, but it lists monero it would it would enable like a huge value add to Monero and makes Monero more valuable, which in turn, which in turn is a um, more value add for the node providers as well. So I think I think we have to consider that scenario as well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, think about a case like Ripple, where the SEC is doing an, an investigation in a matter of like. You know, a few hours every centralized exchange like delisted Ripple because of you know the signal set up by the SEC, and for a lot of people, their, their Ripple was locked up on the exchange; they couldn't even extract it out, which is just like you know nutty to think about. But what if if we had supported if we had Ripple as a chain, for example, 
and I'm not saying that I like or dislike Ripple. I'm just using this as a, a, a real life example. Like, how would that have changed that interaction? Like, would Ripple's price have dropped as far as it did like two years ago when this whole process started? And, you know, I, I, I continue to allow people to be able to buy or, or sell their Ripple at, at will. I mean, that's just, I, I, would, I wish we could do that for chains that get isolated like that for either for government purposes or in Monero's case, privacy purposes. Edward Dunhans. Hello. Hey, everyone. Um, first off, I just want to say I'm such a huge fan of this project. It's been such an enjoyable experience getting to learn about how this works. Um, the design is it's really complicated. It's, it's quite something to wrap your head around. Um, but I feel like every day that I learn more about it, I'm getting a better understanding. And at this point, I'm just trying to think in the longer term about the bigger picture and about things that could potentially go wrong because I'm so convinced of the value. Uh, I'm just wondering if there are any risks that I'm not able to see. And so I have a couple questions. Um, the first one is, I think that there's a possibility that um, in the future, there's gonna be a race to Bitcoin. Um, I, I am increasingly becoming a maxi. And I'm just wondering what would happen to ThorChain as a whole if there was just an, a sudden rapid increase in demand for Bitcoin. Um, I know that uh, the way that the slip mechanism works is that it would just very quickly become expensive for people to race into Bitcoin at the expense of all the other assets um, on ThorChain. Um, but Functionally speaking, how would that go down? Um... Uh, if you had a mad rush for a particular asset, let's call it Bitcoin, um, in terms of like its price and, and the whole world just kind of converging onto Bitcoin for whatever reasons. Um, well, the other pools would probably become much more shallow because people would be dumping their ether to buy Bitcoin or whatever it might be. So the other pools would become very, very shallow. Uh, a lot of the security would, would go towards Bitcoin. There'd be less demand to swap between Bitcoin and Ethereum because, you know, Bitcoin's becoming the centralized focus of so Rune's value in that context of swapping becomes less valuable or less less useful because nobody wants to, to move between Bitcoin and other other chains. So the multi-chain future that Fortune kind of subscribes to become, starts to kind of fall apart to some degree. But at the same point, uh, because ThorChain's uh, DeFi protocols are chain and asset agnostic, the the new kind of protocols that we're creating, such as savers and lending, for example, still exists and still works. And so then all of a sudden, um, you have still a decentralized way to earn sats on your sats uh, using savers, and you can still 3x long your position on Bitcoin or, or to get a Bitcoin loan so that you can you know buy your wife a new car or you know, whatever it is you want to do with that. And so we, we provide a service that nobody else in the industry has or can. I think that inherently would make us much more valuable, um, which would inherently cause the room price to become more valuable just because we're, we're offering services that everybody else is nowhere even remotely close, capable of doing what, we're, what it is that we're doing. And we're doing it, yeah, yeah. I, I really agree that the new functions that are being added um, are definitely improving the value um, more than just swaps. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. It does freak me out a little bit just because um, adding the complexity uh, in my perception, um, just because I don't have the perfect technical understanding that you guys seem to, um, I was a little bit burned by UST and Luna uh, and I thought, oh, that sounds very clever, but I didn't uh, go far enough in trying to understand it. But from the research that I've done into savers and into things like synth, um, it seems so solid. So it's very impressive to me that you guys have been able to think this through and actually implement it. So thank you for that. Um, the set, sorry. No, I was just going to say, like you, you said earlier, it's ThorChain is very complicated and it's hard to wrap your head around. And I was just thinking myself when you when you said that of like imagine trying to create it. <laughs> oh, if it's, hard, if it's hard just to read about it, imagine going through the process of actually trying to invent it and architect it. <laughs> that was hard. <laughs> so, so just imagine my disbelief when I 
see the announcement um, from ThorChain and then I go onto ThorSwap and the functionality is already up and it's working. And um, what sounds too good to be true is already available to just a, a normal person. That's crazy. Um, so just to not hog the mic, I just want to get my second question out. And that's, uh, I, I, it's kind of a scary thing to talk about, but having seen what happened to, I think his name is Alex Pertsev at uh, Tornado Cash, um, I think that the importance of this project is just so large. And uh, there could be so many people uh, actually needing this technology, needing um, this platform in order to do uh, their fi financial transactions um, in order to secure their livelihoods, really. Um, so if this project really does uh, blow up and uh, a lot more people start using it and uh, we integrate chains like Monero, um, is it possible that the regulators would, would view this as being a major threat and start coming after some of the major players in the project? Yeah, actually, I, I just got a DM from Marcus the other day, one of the mem com communities in our, one of the members of our community, and he was specifically asking about this question about, you know, being concerned. Because I, I am I am really the only, not the only one, I, from the core team, I'm the only one that's publicly facing. Um, and then there's some people like, um, you know, Pluto and other people who are, are more public. But like, um, to me, it's like, I actually, uh, I'm excited for that scenario as, as silly and backwards as that might sound just because um if government wants to come after myself for writing code and um you know and speaking publicly speaking and and educating and advocating for something like what thorchain does if they want to come after me and, and like arrest me and take me down because of that i will be fucking happy to take you ass on because code is free speech and to have a legal court proceeding that would that would def that would definitively set that as a, a basic concept of you know american law for example uh is worth the fight right uh if they want to try to arrest me and they, and they go ahead and do it i will sue their fucking asses and i will take them as far up the court as possible to make sure that code uh is freedom is, is, is free speech and should never be silenced or you know any of these kinds of things so like for me it's like yeah that sucks for me because i'm arrested and blah 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 and all these things but it gives me an opportunity to fight for, for crypto in a new type of way that I'm not capable of doing today. And I can actually fight for the legal case uh, in the rights of, 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 of crypto and of DeFi. And imagine if, if I won that court proceedings and, and code is free speech, like imagine the green light that that would give to DeFi to build an experiment and to go further down that road. I also think about how many uh, people in the crypto industry would then learn about ThorChain and like the values that it represents and, you know, stand behind it, which is what we saw largely in the, in the case of, of Tornado Cash. It's like, you know, everyone changing their, and not that that indicates support, but like, you know, change, people are changing their picture to uh, Tornado Cash and it just headlines being written about it. People like, you know, really taking this thing seriously, even if they weren't even users of, of Tornado Cash. And I think something similar would, would happen with ThorChain. Uh, and I think the, the user count would go from, you know, whatever it is now, uh, very vertically up, <laughs> is my opinion. Oh, well, I, I really respect Chad's integrity and, and willingness to fight for this cause down to the last. Uh, but from a selfish standpoint, I don't want to lose you from this community. Um, you're doing such important work and uh, you do it with such a sense of humor and um, I guess just like a kind spirit as well. Um, I appreciate the patience that you have with everybody to explain through stuff that <laughs> most people will never fully understand, but they try. Um, but so would would people be discouraged from using ThorChain if there were some, um, I guess, legal uncertainties? If if there were some declaration to say that you're not allowed to use ThorChain, even if it's not um, constitutional for them to do so, uh, wouldn't a lot of people just stay away because they're worried that their funds are going to be frozen or they're going to be sanctioned or something like that? Uh possibly uh that's that is the possible thing um 
I mean, even as like node operators, node operators have to think about what their risks are, right? In that hypothetical scenario. And maybe they got to move their infrastructure from Seattle to move it to like, you know, Denmark or I don't know, some whatever random country. Um, that would definitely would, would challenge the community for sure. Obviously, with the, if, the, if the government released a, a memo saying the ThorChain was, you know, illegal or, or I don't know, whatever the hell they would call it. Um, just the, this, the memo alone would be, you know, would, would test this community in significant ways. But my hope and my intention is that it would be kind of similar to what happened in China, you know, a year ago when uh, they banned um, mining in, in three of the main provinces of China and the miners just broke down their infrastructure and rebuilt it in other countries. And, and the hash rate's higher now than it ever was before. Like, like, like a few months later, it was higher than it ever was before. So it would it would definitely challenge people for sure, but it would also kind of um, give us an opportunity to 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 become more decentralized to to help uh, achieve our goals. Enforcing compliance on Thorchain swaps, as in like measuring who has swapped through Thorchain and then blocking them from like centralized services, sounds like the biggest pain ever <laughs> just because of how Thorchain functions and it's rotating vault model of it, it's not like there, there's one contract address that your, your funds are always coming through every single week every single three days those addresses are, are, are changing it, this is not uh, I, I think it, actually enforcing some kind of action there is much more difficult than something like tornado cash like I, I like and also completely agree with Chad that things would move to, you know, other areas where they can be compliant. Like it doesn't need to exist geographically within the United States or any other geography. Thorchain is very resistant to, you know, take down or, or capture. So we would just see it pop up in a better jurisdiction. But as for like restricting the actual protocol itself, like it, it seems to me like it'd be pretty difficult to effectively do so and actually stop people from from using it although you know fr front ends are a different part of that question but it seems like it'd be very difficult to actually truly block people from from trading on thorchain or, or accepting coins that were traded on on thorchain oh, that's that's my understanding as well um and the beauty of a decentralized uh, protocol um so th those are all the questions that i have and thank you guys so much for entertaining me Welcome, Edward. Uh, let's do one last question with JB, who's up here. Hey. Hey, what's up, guys? Happy Friday. Uh, so I just had a quick question, because, like, you guys were just talking about, like, any ideas for, like, decentralized, like, charity distribution functionalities, like, in the, like, roadmap for this chain? Because, like, there's two functionalities right now of, like, a saver's vault and, like, a churn list. Or, like, if in the saver's vault, you guys are making, like, 25% AP, APR. And you could take, like, 5% of that, put that in another bucket, add, like, a churn list to that bucket, and then have charities add their crypto addresses, then send that 5% to those addresses. And then you're taking away... Well, you're basically taking away the transaction fees from like Coinbase, Fidelity, and Schwab, because those are the only people that send crypto to charities as donations. So I don't know if anyone thinks that would be valuable to the chain or if that's even possible. Well, is it possible? Yes, it's, it's technically possible. But I also think, at least in my viewpoint, that the that Thorchain should always remain to be uh, an amoral thing. It should it should be like nature in the sense that it has no intentions in one direction or the other. And if you as soon as you get charities involved or or some sort of organizations that are being paid out, like requires governance, that requires conversation, and it also you know has Thorchain itself become take a moral stance on A B C D or E or whatever the hell it's what's going to be. I think if people want to um, develop um, funds for charity that th this project is probably not the place for that. And, and people can do that through other means. If you want to like create a, for example, if you want to create a UI where you can add liquidity to Thorchain and 5% of it goes to charity, you can do that. 
like creating UI saying called like yieldforcharity.com or something like this, right? And just people just can add liquidity, um, get a yield, and then some percentage of their yield goes to like charity A, B, or C. Like you could do that stuff on top of Thorchain, but Thorchain itself should be should remain just completely neutral. Okay, yeah, that definitely answered the question. Thank you. That makes a lot more sense. Cool. Thanks, JV. So yeah, I think we can wrap it there. That's pretty much everything for the week. And uh, I think next week, Thorchads will be pretty happy with with what's coming out the gate. So. I'm I'm really looking forward to that. I'm I'm working hard on the uh, some of the materials on on this side. So I think th- things are looking real nice for the super short term here. So I, I hope everyone's excited for this. By the way, hell yeah, we're excited. <laughs> yeah. So any final final comments uh, that you guys want to leave with? Might, there might be some uh, extra spaces next week, possibly like during the week at, at, at weird times. Where we'll see. We're we're trying to schedule some stuff for uh, for next week, so we'll see what happens. Uh, trying to get some some stuff done before uh, before the holidays start and things start getting a little slower for for a week or two there. But yeah, one one thing we could talk about not not today, but maybe next time we we didn't touch on is the whole concept of ILP and what is the future of ILP. Should we keep keep it continuing? cancel it, grandfather it, um, whatever. That's something I think the community should start kind of discussing. Now that we have savers and we have a no LP, a no IL, uh, um, you know, option for people that I don't think really necessarily need ILP anymore and, and take on the risks that come with ILP. And so next week or, or maybe the week after that, we can start kind of discussing and debating as a, as a community about the, the pros and cons of that. Yeah, yeah, good call. And uh, yeah, I think that's there's definitely a conversation to have like after we start um, it, raising the synth caps and then turning on POL, then it's then that's the time just because then th- there's basically unlimited capacity in the savers vault, like fu- functionally unlimited capacity. So we could, you know, then, then start to, to transition over to savers. Get it going. So cool, guys. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll have some special spaces next week, hopefully. If not, then we'll see you guys next Friday. And uh, yeah, have a great weekend. All right, guys. Good stuff. See you guys. See you.